WGRZ 2 On Your Side presents the 2019 National Edward R. Murrow Award-Winning Story, Seeking a Confession. Here is investigative reporter Steve Brown. Jim Graham, a man born in Buffalo, learned a secret about his past that set off a quarter century long search for truth, his truth, about who his real father is. Our story begins 800 miles from Buffalo. Another day begins in westernmost South Carolina. The creatures are beginning to stir. Among them, Jim Graham. This morning, Graham's back on Twitter. Every day I'm getting more followers, and it, it seems that uh, people that I'm not following are following me. The Buffalo-born 73-year-old is on the social media platform regularly with the ambitious goal of telling his life story one tweet at a time. It's hard to tell it in person. It's such a long, complicated story. So I can kind of condense my thoughts. In Twitter, you have to. Graham's story centers on his upbringing in the 40s and 50s and his parents who divorced when he was very young. His father got custody of all three Graham children. They rarely saw their mother, Helen. The only time I would see her would be four days during Easter and four days during the summer vacation, consecutive days. And there were certain hours that she could see us. And there was 10, to 10 in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. No overnights allowed. The father, John Graham, is described as a gruff, barrel-chested man who ran a Texaco filling station near Maine and Michigan within sight of Freddy's Donuts. Jim Graham says the relationship between the two he was, was cold. With me, he, he never supported me, never said anything kind to me, never played ball with me. Did that confuse you? Uh, well, I, I just thought, I thought that was just kind of a, yeah, it did confuse me, but I just thought that he was... Um, you know, that was his, his, his mannerism. I mean, he, he was a little bit different with other people in the house, but with me, for some reason, there was a, uh, which I could never understand, uh, disdain. Years later at Jim's wedding, they were all there together. But in the late 70s, John Graham passed away. Helen died in the spring of 1993. It was around then that Jim Graham says he started getting wind of a rumor within the family, about the family, that there was some sort of secret that had been kept from him for decades. To find out the truth of the matter, he turned to his Aunt Catherine and Uncle Otto Graham. They lived in this house in Kenmore. The meeting was in the fall of 93, and it was not a friendly meeting. When I went in the house, there wasn't a warm greeting. You can see that they're not happy to discuss what we're going to talk about, what the questions I'm going to ask. I felt like I was an adversary in that in that environment at the day. That day. What happened was Catherine took this uh, out of a newsletter from the Oblate newsletter, this obituary, and she slid it across the kitchen table. And she said, this man may have been your father. We don't know, only the principals know, and they're all dead. And so I looked at the, at the obituary, and right away just looked at the, his nose, uh, his eyebrows, his eyes, and I realized that obviously this was my father. And I, I realized that they knew he was my father, but uh, they weren't going to um, confirm that. In fact, Graham's aunt and uncle refused to give any more information. Given that, how does somebody research a half century old secret about themselves with no family help? It turns out that Jim Graham had a couple of things going for him. He is a successful businessman and today runs a couple of golf related ventures. So Jim Graham has had financial resources to sustain the deep dive into his past that has lasted now almost 25 years. He has hired private detectives, acknowledges spending thousands of dollars in his search, but in the beginning, it was just Graham and that yellowed obit, which contained his first clue. I looked at this newsletter and I saw the address Tewksbury, Massachusetts, and the, obit, the um, newsletter was written by a father ready. So in his first bit of detective work into his own personal history, Jim Graham found Father Reddy in Tewksbury. That led him to a tip about this place, Immaculate Conception Church in Lowell, Massachusetts. It's the home parish for the Sullivan family, where a young Tom Sullivan attended service before becoming a priest. And that's how it went for Jim Graham for months and years. One tip leading to another. Your only begotten son. Graham would learn Father Thomas Sullivan was sent to Buffalo in 1943, two years before Jim Graham's birth. Father Sullivan was a missionary priest assigned to the Oblate Mission Center, which still exists today in Buffalo using space at Holy Angels Church on Porter Avenue. 
Helen Graham was then a married mother with two daughters. If she and Father Sullivan had a romantic relationship and produced a child, it would mean Helen violated her marriage vows. Father Sullivan, his vow was celibacy, and that both had broken the seventh commandment. Obviously, there was a scandal here. Historian and, Martin uh, Ederer is a history professor at general. Buffalo State College. It was really a very different church at that time, um, where a lot more was kind of not out in the open. And it appears the secret was too much for Helen Graham to just sit still. In January of 1947, she took her then toddler son and fled to New York City. Helen found work at the Polyclinic Hospital and lived in the nurse's dormitory. 18-month-old Jim was placed in the care of the Foundling Hospital. Nuns there tended to the children and kept very detailed records. 32 pages, all typed, most of them by a sister, Genevieve Mary. It's 13 months of detailed interviews that the nuns took of my mother every week when she came to pick me up. Helen Graham let the nuns know she was to be known by her maiden name, Helen O'Connell. John Graham, her husband, was listed as step-parent, father listed as unknown. Jim Graham thinks she was not alone, that Father Sullivan was nearby, having fled the ministry. Do you think they ran off with you to be together in New York? Oh, definitely. There's evidence pointing to Sullivan living in the rough Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of Manhattan. They understand he was a bartender and he was a short order cook. He was doing these kind of things to survive in New York while he was, uh, when, after he left Buffalo. If the idea was for Thomas Sullivan and Helen Graham to lay low in New York, their whereabouts may have been revealed early on by the nuns at the Foundling Hospital. After the break, secrets unravel for a runaway couple and the young boy with them when seeking a confession continues. We now continue with Seeking a Confession. The secrets of Thomas Sullivan and Helen Graham began to unravel just weeks after their arrival in New York early in 1947. Helen worked and lived at the Polyclinic Hospital. Jim Graham, age a year and a half, was housed at the Foundling Hospital, which also functioned as an orphanage. Care there was provided by nuns who may have revealed where Helen was hiding. Just weeks after young Jim Graham was placed there, this entry in his care log, baptismal certification received from the Annunciation Church in Buffalo. Annunciation is here on Buffalo's west side and it was the Graham family parish. Through that whole baptismal verification process, the church now knew where very young Jim Graham was and certainly they'd be compelled to tell the family because they'd be wondering where the baby and the mother ran off to. Helen Graham, hiding out in New York the very next month, had a visitor from Buffalo. Log entry, March 11th, 1947. Helen Graham explained Father Larkin from Buffalo had paid her a visit and reported her daughters are doing very nicely and stated Father Larkin was confident everything will turn out right in the end. Who's Father Larkin? Father Larkin, I found out, was a friend, a good friend of uh, Father Sullivan, uh, about 15 years older, from Lowell. Father Larkin returned the next month to visit Jim. So it was a growing circle of people in Buffalo who knew where Helen Graham was hiding. Then in May, little Jim Graham got sick, chicken pox. That resulted in the then one-year-old being transferred to Willard Parker Hospital, a place that specialized in treating infectious diseases like polio. Graham was there for over a month. The hospital wanted to know who was paying James board while he was in the hospital. According to the orphanage log, Helen did not have the money and was very worried authorities in Buffalo would be contacted and worse her husband. She was nervous that uh, the authorities in Buffalo were gonna, were gonna find us. They did. And they did. It was warm that New York City summer night, 2 a.m., July 29th, 1947. Location, 332 West 45th Street, third floor, apartment five. A group of men walked in and found Helen Graham in bed with a man who was not her husband. We know that because of this. It's a transcript for a one-day divorce trial, John Graham versus Helen Graham. Helen was a no-show in court that day, no attorney present for her either. The grounds for the divorce, adultery. There were just three witnesses, John Graham, his brother Otto, and a family friend, Patrick Sheehy. 
private detectives guided them and entered that New York apartment with them for that unannounced middle-of-the-night visit. Only Otto Graham and Sheehy testified about it. Their accounts were very similar. To get in, they got a key from the superintendent or manager of the building. Once inside, they spotted a couple in bed. Otto, Mrs. Graham was getting out of bed and putting a smock on. Sheehy said it seemed like a nurse's uniform. Were they certain it was Helen Graham? There can be no mistake, Otto testified. Sheehy said, yes, sir, it was her. What about the man getting out of bed? He was unclothed, Otto Graham said, just slipping on a pair of pants. Sheehy testified the man was naked, putting on a pair of trousers. Did they know the man? Yes, sir, and yes, I did, were their answers. How did they know him? From Buffalo, they both said. Now, here's the strange part. Neither witness identified the man they saw in bed with Helen Graham. While in the witness stand, they weren't asked and they didn't offer. But the testimony was convincing enough. John Graham got sole custody of all three grandchildren, including then two-year-old Jim. And the attorney that won that divorce case, not your standard family law practitioner, he was a pretty big deal. His name, William B. Mahoney. He was also chairman of the Erie County Democratic Party. His brother, Walter Mahoney, was a Republican state senator. And remember, there were also private detectives involved when Helen Graham and Father Sullivan were located together in New York. Could John Graham afford that? Of course. Private not. detectives, and attorneys? He ran, he ran a gas station. That's not all. The filling station operator and all three of the Graham children were no longer in their city apartment. All of a sudden, we're buying a house in the suburbs in Williamsville. Who's paying for it? The powers to be. And while Jim has some ideas as to who might have helped financially, he has no evidence. And Father Sullivan, what happened to him? He returned to the order and was banished to an oblate encampment near Lake Champlain in Essex, New York. At one time, there was this shrine to Mary there. It and the encampment were dismantled years ago. Father Sullivan never saw Jim Graham again. It was a scheme or it was orchestrated uh, by the powers to be that I live with the Grahams, even though I'm not a, not a Graham, to hide the fact that Father Sullivan was my father. That's his. That's his. He wore it for 59 years. What does it mean to have this? Well, it's a piece of him. It just, I knew this was bouncing off his chest for 59 years, so it uh, makes me feel close to him. Pictures show Father Thomas Sullivan wearing the crucifix. It is among the artifacts Graham has unearthed in pursuit of the truth about his past. He found the log of his stay at the Foundling Hospital after his mother took him and ran away. Detectives Graham paid obtained the transcript of the one-sided divorce trial that severed Jim from his mother at a young age. The accumulated evidence is a story, and Graham wanted it told. First thing that happened is Jim Graham called me. Michael Rosendes is an investigative reporter and worked for the Boston Globe's award-winning Spotlight Unit. The Boston priests molested kids in six different parishes over the last 30 years. The church found out about it and did nothing. Graham had watched the movie Spotlight about the paper's investigation into the priest's sex abuse scandal. Graham wanted Resendiz to write about his family secret. You know, I'm a document guy, and Jim had some extraordinary uh, material. He could not prove <clears throat> without uh, a doubt that Father Sullivan was in fact his father, but the, the documents that he gathered uh, amounted to an overwhelming uh, treasure trove of circumstantial evidence that suggested so very strongly that Father Sullivan was his father. In August 2017, Resendiz wrote a series of stories titled Father, My Father about the children of Catholic priests, a victory, but ultimately not what Graham sought. I'm not looking for money, just want them to be transparent. And he wanted a confession, a public acknowledgement from Catholic authorities that he is the son of a priest. Instead, the Globe Stories produced a surprise in the form of new allies for Graham, like Olin Horn. I was here in the house by myself. I read his story, and I, and I actually put my hand on my chest. I mean, it emotionally took a breath away from me. Horn got in touch with Jim Graham and offered to help. As a boy, Horn was abused sexually by a Boston area priest, and later Horn became a victim advocate. 
He gets frequent access to Boston Cardinal Sean O'Malley, an influential advisor to Pope Francis. Horn set his sights on a meeting with O'Malley to plead Jim Graham's case. Once the truth is told, the story begins to blossom. The truth is, is I don't need anybody to convince me that they haven't done the right thing. And I'm not here to convince you that the Oblates are good or bad. I'm here to get Jim an answer to his question. If you get the sense that Olin Horn is not a guy who accepts no for an answer, well, we got the same impression. And he did get that meeting with Cardinal O'Malley. It was here at the Pastoral Center for the Boston Diocese. It was on a Friday in December, two days before Christmas. O'Malley in that meeting agreed to call Father Louis Studer, the leader of the Oblate Order in the U.S. headquartered in Washington. Two on your side also put a call into Father Studer for comment. This is what a priest at the Oblates National Headquarters told us by voicemail. Father Studer is not interested in making a statement. We have spoken with Mr. Graham. We simply have no information that would either confirm or, or uh, deny uh, what he's concluded. It was a dead end. Much of the last third of his life spent seeking a confession, and Graham was no closer to getting it. You're 72. Do you think you're going to get what you're looking for? Are you asking me running out of time? <laughs> we, we're all travelers on this planet, right. Right? right? Nobody's here forever. Sure. You know, tomorrow's never promised. You've been in pursuit of this information for 24 years, in right. pursuit of an apology for 24 years. That's right. You haven't gotten it yet. No. And I don't know if I'm getting closer, but I'm not going to stop. Obviously, thousands of stories like this, but I think it's time that, you know, the church says, yes, we did these kind of things, and hopefully they'll do less of them. Up next, a door is open for Jim Graham to gather the proof he sought for decades, the dramatic conclusion of seeking a confession after this. And now, the conclusion of seeking a confession. Denied the confession about who his biological father is, we asked Jim Graham if science might provide the solution, but he was unconvinced. You know, I thought at one time, you know, I could ask uh, to have my father's remains um, brought up in, into a DNA test, but I thought that would be just kind of grandstanding. However, after our stories aired, Graham had a change of heart. In February of 2018, he wrote the head of the Oblate Order in the U.S., Father Louis Studer, asking to exhume the remains of Father Sullivan. With your permission, we can bring closure to my 25-year quest for the truth with just a DNA sample. A month later, the shocking answer, permission granted. We talk with Graham via Skype about that startling news. I didn't think they would come back and give me approval. I thought for sure they would turn me down. So I was totally surprised when I saw that they would grant me that permission. And I just, I just don't understand why they're doing it at this point. The complicated exhumation process would take months to set up. Father Thomas Sullivan's remains are buried in a small cemetery in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. We next saw Graham on the day after Father's Day as he set off to witness that exhumation. It's been such a, a stressful time to prepare for this and to think about it and to get, get it organized. You know, I don't know anybody that's gone through this before. Media and cameras were barred from the exhumation, a condition insisted on by the Oblates. Three hours later, Graham arrives at a nearby parcel store to ship off tissue and bone samples collected by Dr. Anne Marie Myers, a forensic anthropologist. Once we opened the casket, it was very obvious. It was very well preserved. We took a plug of the femur. Uh, we took a big toe. We took a finger. And then we took a section of the mandible uh, in the back of the jaw. Graham was only permitted to watch from a distance with an obstructed view. The whole time I was thinking about what's going on behind that blue tarp. So I was just thinking about the process and I was thinking that, you know, this is kind of the end of the road for this portion <coughs> of my story uh, because we're going to get the validation that he is my father. Graham's stubborn devotion and years of painstaking research had brought him to the brink of the truth. And he was grateful for the stories he's heard told by others, but he has no memories of his own of Father Sullivan. What would you say? Um, I would just say, you know, I, 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 we, we missed a lot, the two of us. Didn't have that opportunity. 
It's father and son. Graham then headed back home to South Carolina to wait for the results of DNA testing. The wait would stretch out for 11 agonizing weeks. It's the first day of classes at this small Catholic college in central Massachusetts. In the school library, Buffalo-born Jim Graham came here to learn whether what he has believed in his heart for a quarter century is true, that a deceased priest is his biological father. Dr. Myers, the medical examiner who collected Thomas Sullivan's tissue samples for paternity testing, had the results with cameras and reporters looking on. You've driven all the way from South Carolina um, to find out um, whether Father Thomas Sullivan is your father. And I'm here to tell you that he is. I don't think I've ever hugged a doctor before, <laughs> but thank you. The probability of relatedness as described above is 99.99999%. For Graham, the news is a mixture of relief and validation. So when I tell my story, there's always some hesitation because we didn't have it validated. So some people could question if he was really my father. But science has now eliminated those questions. There's been so much circumstantial evidence that you've dug out yourself. Right. And it was satisfactory to you Correct. for all of these years, but not to church officials. Exactly. And now you have scientific certainty of this fact. Right. What comes next? The Catholic Church all along, they know who I am. And they all know I'm his son. You know, I look just like him. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's bittersweet, and everybody says it's, it's, it's amazing what you've done so far, but you don't have an ending. So now we do have an ending, and it's not really the, the ending I was looking forward to, because I didn't think we'd have to go through what we went through, and what Dr. Myers had to do. You know, my, my father is speaking today, you know, to all of us through his DNA. For all he accomplished investigating his own life story, there is something Jim Graham did not get. The Oblate Order has still not publicly acknowledged the now scientific fact that Thomas Sullivan is Graham's father. So what is Jim doing now? Well, he's back home in South Carolina with his wife, Melody, and he's back at work sharing his tale on social media. He's also gotten an agent who's pitching the story to Hollywood. Now, before we go, a few thank yous. Everything you've just seen would have been impossible without my epically talented partner on this project, photojournalist David Harrington. Thanks also to Lori Fry, who introduced me to Jim, to the great Michael Resendiz. Thank you for lighting the torch. And a special thank you to investigative reporter Karen Hensel and NBC Boston, who was so very generous to us. And if you liked Seeking a Confession, please tell a friend. It's posted on our website, WGRZ.com. Thanks for watching.